everybody, welcome to our bonus podcast. Uh, I'm the host Donatos Rubanas and I'm joined uh, by a special guest who carries a special uh, story uh, throughout his career. Uh, multiple top scorer of Warriors, uh, Warriors uh, basketball league starting from CBA China to, to EuroCup to Greece, EuroCup champion, EuroCup uh, MVP, uh, winner of multiple cups uh, in Europe, uh, Eric McCollum, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for thanks for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, before our conversation, I have to uh, say that we are grateful for Radisson Hotel, which led us into this beautiful apartment on the eighth floor. It's the hotel where the most of Euroleague teams uh, are staying before the Euroleague games against uh, against Zalgiris Konas. And uh, we weren't paid for this, what I'm going to say, but I invite you to uh, buy Euroleague TV pass. Uh, because that's how you can follow both Eric McCollum, both Lokomotiv Krasnodar uh, for the upcoming EuroCup season, which is going to be very exciting. Uh, but also there's another reason, because I know that one great guy is, uh, probably will also have the EuroLeague pass. Uh, it's your brother, CJ McCollum. I was actually, you know, it's pr- pretty obvious because CJ, as you told, he's not just your brother, he's your best friend. But I, I was, you know, a bit surprised and it was exciting to hear that CJ has the EuroLeague TV pass like three years ago when you were on the Eurostep pod and he watched EuroLeague basketball, probably most of the games were yours. I mean, playing for Anadolu FS. Uh, but tell me, Eric, what he thinks of EuroLeague basketball. Do you, what, what do you talk with him about EuroLeague basketball? Uh, he likes it. Um, he likes the strategy, um, you know, uh, the intensity of every game. Uh, he really enjoys the crowds. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, he didn't get to experience it last year when we were in the EuroLeague, but you know, he, he's got to see the crowds, um, how involved they are, how passionate, and just a high level of play. Um, a lot of quality players. And, you know, when you're a fan of the game of basketball, it doesn't matter if it's an NBA, yearly. If you see high level play um, and you see, you know, good tacticians, good strategies, good coaches, um, it draws you. And I think he became a fan of your basketball. And, you know, he's always watching my games um, a lot of times with the time difference. He's watching them um, maybe during his shoot around or you know, during the stretch and the time he's getting a massage, but he stays in tune and, you know, he's always watching me and I'm always watching him. Uh, which team he did like the most, uh, except from yours, of course? <laughs> Outside of mine, uh, his favorite team is Barcelona. Okay. Yeah, he, he loves the weather. Um, I think he likes the, the style of Spanish play, how they play so fast, up and down. And he always jokes with me and says, um, when he's done playing, maybe he'll play one year in Barcelona. So I, I tell him you won't. I say it's different than Europe. Um, not as much um, freedom um, as NBA, you know. Yeah, and <laughs> especially now with Coach Arunas is here, which is what's controlling the team. Yeah, I told him NBA is a player's lead. Um, Euro lead is more like um, a coach's lead. You know, the coaches kind of run the systems and, you know, they have, you know, a lot of say and power. Maybe not so much in NBA, you know, kind of a lot of stars kind of control a lot of things. So I tell him uh, that would be an adjustment for um, for you NBA guys. But that's that's actually my next question uh, because as, as CJ joked about you guys playing together for the EuroLeague team, it won't happen at least uh, until 2024 before his contract with Portland expires. Uh, but you know, let's let's have that hypothetical situation that your brother is coming to Europe. Which team you guys would love to play for <laughs> in the current situation? <laughs> Uh, well, right now it'd be um, Lokomotiv Kuban. Um, that's where I play. Um, you know, it's actually a, a hidden gym in Russia. It's good weather, um, and he would he would just want to play with me. Um, we haven't played with each other since high school. Um, I'm three and a half years older, so he was only uh, 14 years old, and at that time I was 17 or 18, and he was still young, body still developing. But um, you know, if it, if it was a, his choice, he would choose a city with good weather and with things to do for our wives. But, you know, for us, as long as we're out there playing, that would be, you know, amazing. But, you know, as time passes, you know, some things can happen. And I don't think it will ever happen. You know, I think um, his salary is probably the cost of a whole yearly budget, but <laughs> he'd be the only player out there. Yeah, but he will have enough money, you know, to spend one year just enjoying basketball with, with, your, with his older brother. This is true. This is true. Yeah, I hope I hope that uh, it will happen one day. But I, I was also curious uh, to ask you, since you guys, you know, coming from like, let's say, a family of scorers, you know, uh, pure talent of, of scoring the uh, the ball. Who did you like the most, or who do you like the most in the Euroleague among the scorers? Who do you consider the best scorer in the Euroleague at the moment for this season? Yeah, yeah, for at least for the 
mm, current seasons? Mm. Um, well, I would say, I mean, for this season, a really good score, I think, is uh, Nicolo. Um, mm -hmm. He's a guy who, who doesn't need a lot of shots. Um, he's smart at drawing fouls. He can use the pick and roll. Um, he's good in the ISO situation against the big. Um, scores in transition. Um, I like his efficiency. You know, he's oh, yeah. a guy who's going to shoot a good percentage from the field. He scores a lot of points, but the team still stays involved. So he's a guy that's always had a chance to win a scoring title, and he plays the game offensively um, very impressively. Um, another guy who's a really good scorer. Um, um, I like guys who can score, you know, three or four different ways mm -hmm. from the three point line, from the mid range, inside the paint, and from the free throw line. I think when you can do that, you're very hard to guard just because in the yearly teams try to take away, you know, what you do best. But if you can score in a mile or two of ways, um, it makes it extremely difficult to stop you. Um, another good score is, um, Shane Larkin. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's explosive. He's extremely fast. Um, he can get to the paint. He can finish left hand, right hand. He has a good floater. Um, he can shoot the pull up off the jumper. Even though he's small, um, he gets good elevation, um, creates his shot, plays pick and roll. So, I mean, to me, those two are like probably the best scores that I enjoy watching. And they're both efficient. Um, you know, a lot of people see points. I think percentages are important. I think, you know, Scoring in the flow of a game, helping your team, those are important things. And that's why I probably say those two are probably the best scores in the year league for the 21 22 season. Mm -hmm. Scoring is also the kind of, you know, packet of, um, package of skills which also hel uh, helps you, uh, you know, to build your career. Uh, what uh, definitely didn't help, at least in the beginning, probably was your height. And I feel you uh, for that because I also, hey, you know, I had my dreams broken because of my height. Uh, Even to this day, I remember that day when my coach, uh, or let's say the teacher, uh, uh, you know, left me out uh, of the team because of my height. I was too short and stuff like that. And I, you know, at that time I was too young. I didn't have that character. You know, I just let my dance, uh, hands down and I kind of, you know, finished my basketball dreams. You know, I just continued playing in the street with my friends and stuff like that, but I never took it seriously. Uh, for, in, do you remember any kind of, you know, cuts? Uh, which you remember to this day and how did you react after all these cuts yeah actually um so my first uh actually my second year so first year i played in israel i didn't play many minutes um i was first lead and we had six foreigners but only two could be on the court at once and so fast forward that season um, i was the youngest the, the lowest paid out of the foreigners and you know i just didn't get many opportunities maybe i played 10 minutes a game And so I jumped to the second lead the following year just because I wanted a chance to to prove myself, to get to play and to show that I belong. And so I went to second division Israel and I had a really good year. I think I was import player of the year. I was a leading scorer and, and then I had offers um, from some smaller first divisions and then um, a second division Turkey. And at that time, second division Turkey was paying very well, yeah. one of the best um, in Europe. And they were paying first division money and, you know, it was very respected. So. I went there for the preseason and like in my contract, I had like a little tryout period and I did excellent um, in the preseason. We won a preseason uh, tournament. Um, I was MVP. I played great. But during that time period, um, true point guards were more what was in style, classical point guards. You know, I think if you fast forward to that to that time period, it was like um, I think Steve Nash, those type of guards were getting all the rave. And the coach wanted a true point guard and he said that You know, I want you to be, uh, I wanted a true point guard. You know, we were a really good player. You're playing good, but I want someone who's just a classical point guard. And, uh, and at that time, I didn't, I didn't know what to do, but we had one game left. So, you know, I was like, I'm going to show him I can be a classical point guard. So I didn't really shoot that much. Maybe I had like 13 or 14 points, but I went and had like eight, nine assists, you know, six or seven rebounds just to show I could run a team. You know, it's not my style. I'm a guy who can score and create, but... You know, I just wanted to, to fit in and, you know, to have a job in Europe and kind of solidify my name. And then afterwards, they just say that um, they like me and they're going to keep me in mind. But if, um, if they don't find a classical point guard, they want me. And if they do, then, you know, I'll be on my way. And my agent was like, forget that. Um, we're not going to wait. You already have teams who are interested in you. They like you. And I literally got um, basically cut from uh, second division Turkey and 
within 20 hours, I had a job in First Division Greece to be a point guard there. So obviously they must have saw something. They liked it. And it ended up being a blessing because I got to go to a higher level. I got to play against better teams, better competition. And I end up, it was a team that just moved up to the second, from the second division to the first division. And it was their first year in the first league. So their only ambitions was to stay in the league. It was Patras. I yes, guess, yeah. Apollon Patras. And we end up making the playoffs. And I was like third best scorer of the entire Greek league. And it's funny, like after two months into that season, that team that cut me was calling like, would Eric come back? Like, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. And I'm on a, a better level now. And that kind of solidified me as someone who could play at the first league level. And I started getting attention from a lot of Euro Cup teams and those, and it kind of took off my career from there. So, you know, that just taught me that everybody's not gonna like your game. Um, everybody's not gonna like your style. All it takes is one coach or one team to like your style. And when you go there, you just continue to be a good person, you continue to work and your opportunity will come. Um, it's kind of like, I look at it like marriage. You don't need every girl to love you. You just need one girl to love you, that's it. And that's kind of how I look at basketball teams. You find that one team that loves you at that moment who likes you, they'll give you a contract and you go and you play your heart out for them. Yeah, it was it was a good lesson. I actually also had the question because probably, you know, it was your rookie experience in Europe. You were playing for the Israeli team and you played like only six game, uh, minutes per game. I, I was just thinking, you know, what went uh, through your mind, you know, uh, you, you came from the division two, uh, you started your career in Europe and this this is how it starts. I mean, uh, do you remember? I mean, where you where you at? What were you thinking about about your future probably? I never forget it. Um, it's what drove me my whole career. Um, I had times where I had doubts. Um, I was unsure. I was thankful I had graduated. I had my degree in business and I was thinking like, maybe basketball is over. Maybe I'm gonna have to get a job. Maybe I'm gonna have to work. And you know, my, my parents prepared me. Um, they pushed academics just to make sure that, you know, you have um, other um, opportunities outside of basketball. Um, obviously you want to work hard, you're going to do everything, but you're not just a basketball player, you're intelligent um, and you can be successful in whatever you do. So that was pushed on me early on. So I knew I could be successful. I just didn't know if basketball was going to be the route just because I wasn't given an opportunity. Um, I always believed I was good enough. I was talented enough, but you know, sometimes as a young player, you don't get those minutes, you don't get to play. And maybe you deserve it through your work ethic, maybe through your actions and practice, but sometimes it just doesn't come, but you just have to keep working, you have to keep pushing, you have to keep pushing. And eventually, uh, I don't know what, the basketball guys, I don't know what, but eventually your moment comes and, and you might only get one opportunity, but when it comes, you have to be ready to seize it. So um, that whole year, it was, a, it was, it was horrible um, because you come from a small college and you're an All-American four years in a row, you used to being the main player, and you know what you can do, but you know mentally as a young guy, that can kind of weigh on your confidence. So uh, as I you know, continued to, to work out and continue to push year after year, I always kept that in the back of my mind, just that season. So anytime I was tired and I didn't feel like going to the gym or feel like lifting, I just remember how they sat me on the bench, like how they didn't think I was good enough. And, and every year it just pushed me, pushed me in. So for the longest, every time I went back to Israel, when I play yearly, I try to kill Maccabi Tel Aviv. Yeah, I, killed, I killed try him. to kill him every time because it's not their fault, but I just, anytime I go to Israel, I just remember like how they did me, how I didn't get to play, how that, how that coach and that team just sat me on the bench. And, and I love Israel. It was a great country, great experience, but I just like, I always want to beat their team. I want to win. And, and that was kind of my mindset. And I try to carry that with me against every team because, um, at any moment, your career can change. Um, you know, you can go from one year playing and playing great to when you're not not playing and people start to question you. So luckily for me, it happened early in my career and, you know, it created a mental toughness, allowed me to know that I can go through anything, you know, because sometimes you have to go through adversity to realize what you made of or to realize, you know, what you're capable of. Every time I come to Israel, I take it personal. It's, it's your quote after your career high game against Maccabi. It, it, you played for Anadolu FS. You scored 31 points and you just destroy them. Yeah, it's, it's just crazy. And it, it, it also comes, you know, you, you, you mentioned a lot of very important things. And I, I have a quote of your 
probably you know who, who is the author uh, of, of this quote. I wouldn't be in the position I'm today as an NBA player if Eric didn't push me to work hard and to take not only basketball seriously, uh, but academics too. And uh, you mentioned you, you always had that motivation. You have all. You were always determined, and you always had that discipline. And for example, uh, I asked a few people, for example, from the last uh, season, and they told that in in Kimki er, every day off you had something like a shooting routines. In in loco, you also impressed people mm, the way you approached the tests, and because it was not just you know some regular test for you, you wanted you know to to hit the highest score or some physical uh, results, and it tells a lot uh, about your dedication uh, for what you do. And I I was just thinking, you know, as a as an older brother, uh, who set an example for you the way how. You know, how do, we, how do you need to achieve something? How do you need to, you know, to seek something? And who was your example? Oh, for us, it was our parents. Um, every day they went to work. Um, they provided us with our lifestyle opportunities. Um, we were a middle class family. You know, we didn't have everything we wanted, but we had what we needed. And when you see them working and pushing to provide a lifestyle for you, um, it's motivational because you see that some days they don't want to go to work or some days maybe they're not liking their job or they don't have a good day, but you know, they got two kids, they got two. And so when you see that every day, every night, like you want to make sure that you put yourself in a position to provide yourself um, or your future family with the best lifestyle you can provide. So just seeing my parents push us, um, mom was big in basketball, but she was huge in academics. And, you know, our parents divorced when we were young, but you know, she instilled that mentality of, you know, handling academics, handling school, and then whatever you do, it didn't matter if it was football, basketball, baseball, track, um, you put forth all your effort into it, you be the best you can. And then same with my dad, like this is a guy who, you know, when I was in college and he would call me and he'd say, what are you doing? We have our conversation. And I'm like, um, I'm about to go to this party with my teammates and my friends. And my dad's like, a party? What are you celebrating? Did you graduate college? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm a sophomore, dad. I have two more years. Uh, uh, did you win a championship? I'm like, no, like, we still in the middle of the season. Like, he's like, the party's more fun when you're rich. And he would be like, go we'll put your work in. So, like, for me, I still enjoyed my life. But when he would say that, I'd be like, I would feel bad. So I'd go to the gym immediately and go work on my game. And then after that, then I'd go hang out with my friends. And so, like, early on, it was instilled in me to to have fun, to enjoy your life because you only have one. But before you do that, handle your responsibilities, handle your, your goals, your dreams. And, and then as I grow an older brother, I knew that CJ would follow whatever I did. You know, he looked up to me. I knew if I took um, a bad step, he'd take that same step. So like I was very cognizant of, you know, making sure I set a good example because I knew whatever I did, he would copy. And so we would get up, wake up, go work out, you know, we finish our homework, um, do all those type of things. And, and I think it just, it became a habit. When you do something over and over again, um, it just becomes natural. You don't even have to think about it. So like waking up to go work out early in the morning, like at first it sucks, it does. But then after a month, after two months, after a year, after two years, it's just what you do. It's like brushing your teeth. It's like tying your shoes. You don't even have to think about those things. And that's kind of how academics and basketball became for us. Was CJ an irritating young brother? Because as I said, you know, <laughs> three and a half years and you know, I have, my wife has three brothers and you know, it's it's like, you know, ask one of them, you know, to, to take the youngest one to the outside. And it's like, come on now, he's he's too young. You know, I want to hang out with my friends. What do you remember about that kind of, you know, brotherhood? Oh uh, yeah, it was, um, he was annoying, but I loved him. Um, I, I wanted to like go play with my friends. A lot of my friends, some of them are older than me. So like, if you think three, four year age difference, this is pretty big, especially like for size, um, maturity level, all those type of things. And I would try to go play and I would try to make him stay inside. And my mother would say, um, if he can't go, you can't go. So like she basically made me take him. And so years I'm just taking him and I didn't want to take him. I hated it, but I would take him with me because if I didn't, he couldn't come. And then if I didn't let him play, he would go tail on me. And so eventually we let him play and he wasn't very good at first because he was so much younger, so much smaller, um, just didn't have the physical um, 
maturity that everyone else had. And it's expected when you're four or five years younger than everybody. And But since he was playing with people older than him, eventually, after time, he started to get better. And then it got to the point where we wanted him to play or we wanted him in because now he was no longer a bad player. Now, okay, he's okay. And he just kept growing. And I think that's why he improved so much, just because he was playing against bigger, stronger, older, faster kids. And it forced, it forced him to improve um, and to develop quickly. Four years after uh, being kind of, you know, cut from the second Turkish division team or like that Israeli rookie experience, you score 82 points. Uh, how did the next day uh, look like? What did you do <laughs> in the next morning? Uh, it was... I, 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 again, shoot around or... Uh, I was tired. So <laughs> I think I had to do Your day wrist off. was tired probably. Yeah, legs, everything, like all your body, everything. But I think um, I had the day off. Um, uh, I think my social medias were going crazy, notifications, um, interviews, stuff. Like people were calling me friends and uh, they were asking me if it was real. And I was like, yeah, it, is, it was real. And how did you do it? I'm like, it's an out of body experience. Um, you, know, you just get in the zone, um, you're hitting shots, your teammates do an excellent job of setting screens, getting your ball in the right spots. And, you know, it was just one of those days that you probably can never relive. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I think you could go out and try to do that. And I don't know if it's possible. Like, it just has to be a day where everything's just going in. Uh, and I'm a guy who scores in spurts. So, like, if I see the ball go in once or twice, um, it, I don't know, but the basket just gets bigger for me and I can score more and more and more. But um, maybe maybe a lot of scores feel that way. But it's just it helps you get in the rhythm, helps you get in the flow. And I literally uh, probably the best the basket ever felt. <laughs> yeah, it's it's still a record in, in China and probably it puts your name on the map, at least globally. You know, that that game. I mean, did it did it change the perspective of how the teams were looking at you? What do you think? Did it help you? I think I think what really changed I think was the year in Peñones. I think um, I played at a Euro Cup level. Um, Dropolos was my coach, the Maccabi coach now, and you know he was really key in my development. Um, you know, just you know, put me at the point guard position. You know, using my scoring ability, but you know, helping me learn how to play the pick and roll, um, when to create, when to score, those type of things. And you know, he allowed me to be me. You know, but you know, tinkered with me, helped me to be able to fit the system. Like a lot of coaches, they try to get the player, change the player to fit the system. But I think that the really good coaches, you either get the players who fit your system immediately or the really good ones, the great ones can adapt. And they have a system, but they adapt for the pieces and and they allow players to play to their strengths, but also to do what they need in that system. I think he did a good job of that. And that kind of, that year took me off to the mat because I think, Maybe I was like one of the top scorers in Greek League, one of the top scorers in Europe. I Euro think you Cup. were the top scorer actually in yeah, both tournaments. In both leagues, yeah. For Pandelinios, uh, right? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, and we were good. I think we were like third place in the lead. Um, and I got to show what I could do against some of the, the bigger yearly teams, Olympiacos, Panathinaikos, and that shot my career up. And then teams knew I could score, but I think that the year in China, when you have success in many different places, because a lot of players can stay on one team. You know the system, you know the coach, you know the role. Everything is like laid out for you. It's so much easier to adjust when you stay two, three, four years on a team. But when you see a guy who switches teams and continues to have success, that tells you that he's smart. He can learn different offenses quick. I'll also tell you he's a chameleon. Um, he's able to adapt to different personalities because every team has different teammates, has different type of people, and you might have a different role. And I think it's most impressive when guys switch teams and they're able to to start right where they left off. And I think, you know, that kind of showed it. And I, I think um, my scoring ability in China kind of put things in a magnifying glass because there's a lot of high level scores, a lot of NBA guys and, you know, all those guys with all that talent. That year, I was fortunate enough to be, you know, the best scorer in the league. So, you know, it was like I could do it in Asia and I also could do it in Europe. And, you know, I had, I had some success there. I, I checked the list uh, of all CBA players who scored over 70 points. And except from Sun Yan, if, if I spell it uh, right, if I, if, if I pronounce it right, uh, I think that all of these guys, except from you again, uh, played in NBA at some point of, of your career. Uh, was there any moment wh where you were so close to the NBA? What, what was the closest moment to the NBA? Mm, the year, um, I think the year after... Um... Pan Jonas, 
or it might have been a year after I was 25 or 26 and um I had an offer from NBA team to be third point guard and it wasn't going to be many minutes um they had uh, a guy who had just signed like a 40 or 50 million dollar contract at the time he was the main guard um then uh, the second guard was a guy they had drafted in the draft early and there was a third point guard spot open it was actually the Atlanta Hawks so it was uh, Jeff Teague and Dennis Schroeder, and they were, they said there won't be many minutes for you um, unless someone gets hurt. Someone gets hurt, there would be a big role. And at that time, the minimum for NBA contract was probably half of what it is now. And I was trying to decide, you know, if I wanted to go to the NBA or if I wanted to, you know, continue on the European or you know the China path. And I had worked so hard to finally like build my name up in Europe that. I didn't feel like the opportunity to go to the NBA was worth it because I didn't want to be in a situation where, okay, I'm here, but I don't get an opportunity to play. And some people like that. Like, it depends on the person. Some people just want to be in the NBA. You know, for me, I felt what it was like to, to play professionally and not play. And I didn't want to feel that no more. So I chose, I enjoyed Europe. I like the experience. Um, I like embracing different cultures. I like meeting different people. I like traveling the world. And I like the style of basketball. So whether it was Europe or China, like I enjoyed that. And I turned down the hooks. And uh, I mean, I went to China that year. And um, I mean, the salary was probably four times, four or five times what the NBA was offering me because of the taxes and stuff. Yeah. But um, it wasn't even just about the money. Like I would have took less money if there was a role for me. But in the third, in the third point guard in the NBA doesn't play. I mean, DNPs. And so, like, how can you even show that you're worthy of playing in the NBA or that you can maintain, not beyond this season? So you don't want to play in the NBA for one year. You want to play many years. So how can you show if you don't play? And then if you sit out basically a whole year not playing, your value is kind of hurt in Europe because it's almost like a year off. And I just feel like I worked so hard and I wanted to continue to build my, my career in Europe. And I was content with that. Like, the NBA to me... It was cool, it's, it's a great opportunity. Um, it's the best lead in the world, but I feel like everybody has a different path. And, you know, my goal is, you know, I wanted to be happy and not famous. Um, if fame came, okay, but that wasn't important to me. Happiness was first and then second, I'd rather be rich than famous. And, and at that time, um, plan, more playing time, which is happiness, <laughs> and then more money was greater to me than than being famous or being able to say I played in NBA. And it took a lot of maturity to get to that point, but um, that's the point I reached. And I no longer chased the NBA. It no longer was a desire of mine. If it happened, it happened, but I wasn't going to look for it. And it was the summer 2016, something like that, was, right? Um, the, before I went to China, yeah. So before 16, it was um, after the Panyonis season. That summer between when mm. I played in Panyonis and I got... Um, for your first China deal, yeah. yeah. And I went to China the first time. Yeah, because when you went to China, it was season 2014 and 15, probably you scored, you had that 82 point game. Then the, the same summer after the season, you won the, the basketball tournament, right? Uh, so you yes. shared the 1 million prize. The next season, you come to Galatasaray and you win the Euro Cup. You, you, you became the Euro Cup MVP. And uh, I, I was thinking, I was curious about that, you know, free agency 2016, uh, because it seemed like, you know, your career was speaking. It seemed like, you know, you were like five minutes away from like one of the yearly powerhouses offer uh, after two very successful seasons. And you went back to China uh, again. Uh, do you remember what was your uh, free agency situation? Because, you know, many people say that time, it's Sometimes it's all about timing, both in the NBA and the New York League too. You know, it's, it's the matter of, you know, uh, being on the right time and the right place. Uh, and sometimes it helps to boost your career. And for me personally, it's just my personal opinion, it seemed like the timing was 2016. Mm -hmm. And as the Euroleague fan, I, I would have, you know, I wished you, you played in the Euroleague, but you went to China. I, mm -hmm. There are no regrets about your career, that's for sure. You know, you reached a lot, your journey was special, but were there any specific re regrets about that specific summer, talking about your potential in the EuroLeague? Uh, it was tough. Um, I know I talked to a lot of EuroLeague coaches. Um, sometimes um, I would go to Vegas with my agent, and you know, during that time, it was basically everybody was there. Um, NBA teams, EuroLeague teams, EuroCup, pretty much all the scouts. And, you know, a lot of them didn't want me to go 
to China. You know, I was a young talent. You know, I showed a lot of promise. Um, and a lot of European coaches don't like the China Chinese league. Um, the style is a lot different. Um, you know, I think it's not as bad as they think. Um, the foreigners are extremely talented. Um, obviously, it's not at the level of the Euro League. Um, you know, as far as talent wise, um, strategy, level of play, it's not there. But it's a lot of really good foreigners. Um, Americans have to shoulder a lot of responsibilities. And, and oftentimes, I believe it helped my offensive game because you know, you're getting a, lot, a higher usage rate. Um, you're ha having to learn how to score between double, sometimes triple teams. And you're, you're shortering the load. You have to create, you have to score everything. But at that time, you know, I just enjoyed hooping. Um, and for me, um, it didn't matter where it was, you know, as long as I was on the court, as long as I was able to provide for myself and my family, you know, that's what it was about. So, you know, China, I felt like it was um, a country that gave me that opportunity. You know, they gave me uh, the best contract by far, but also the opportunity to play 40 minutes a night. And, and it's a short season. Like um, a lot of people don't know, but like they, it's a blessing and an honor to play basketball for a living. But you really are detached from your family because you're gone nine or 10 months. And yes, you might have your wife and your son, but I, you don't see your brother, you don't see your aunts, your uncles, your parents, you rarely see anybody. Like you miss all the holidays. And that's where a lot of guys struggle. Like you'll see in a lot of young players, they have a lot of difficulty adjusting, not because they're just away from home, but sometimes home is people. You know, when you're around your loved ones or people you care about and you don't really get to see them or when tragedy strikes, things happen. And so China provided players with opportunity to play the game they love um, to be compensated, you know, accordingly, but to be gone for four or five months. And so for me, that was, you know, that was appeasing. That was something I really liked just to be able to be around that and, you know, to be with my family. But then I also just enjoyed the play. And so like, sometimes it's tough to choose, you know, which path you want to take. Um, decisions can de determine your career one way or another. Like for me, I had no regrets only because everything I've done, it led to my happiness. You know, sometimes other people won't understand it. You know, they might not like the decision you made, but that's not for them to like. At the end of the day, you have one life and you choose what you want to do. And, and that's how I live my life. Every choice I make is for me to be happy. It's for my wife to be happy. It's for my son to be happy. You know, it's not for anybody else's. And, and though they won't understand that, you know, you respect the fans, you want the best for them, but this is your life. And, and that's why I did that. And then on top of that, you know, I have a family I want to take care of. Basketball only lasts so long. You know, you can only play so long. You never know you're one injury away from being done, from nobody wanting you, one major injury away from from being at the bottom and being out. So I understood that, and, and fans probably don't, but oftentimes as a player, you got to put yourself in a financial position to take care of your family. Um, it's not sometimes it's not just you. you. You want to help people. You want to help your community. You want to do things for people. And and unfortunately, the way you do that is with money. You know, you want to give money to outreach programs or you want to help underprivileged kids or, you know, you want to help the city that's, you know, in poverty. You need money to do that. And so you get your contracts, you try to find ways to find passive income to grow your money and, and then you give back. So China, you know, put, put me in a position to be able to do all those things that I wanted to do. And, you know, I don't regret it. If I could do it all over again, I'd do the same thing because I still was able to play at the early level. That was a goal of mine. I came from an NAI school. I'm not supposed to be here. You know, I see guys who came from big schools, who played in NBA, and I'm still here, you know, and that's just, you know, a blessing from God. You know, it shows that, you know, I'm blessed. It shows I worked hard and I've done things the right way. You know, I played at the early level. I played in China. I was the only guy who wasn't in the NBA in China. Like, and it just shows that sometimes it's not about where you come from. It's just about, you know, if you're dedicated, if you work hard. I'm not big. You know, I'm not 6'6", six, 6'5". Six, six, like, you know, I'm 6'2", 188 meters. And, you know, everything I do is through hard work. And I feel like when you work hard and you bust your butt, you do everything you got to do. You earn the right to make your decisions and your choices. And, and you don't have to explain to nobody. But, you know, at the end of the day, fans, sometimes they'll be upset. But... 
you know, I like that. I, I like their passion because, you know, the game needs fans with that passion. That's what makes Europe so special. So I never get upset when they like tweet me or message me or they talk bad because, you know, I know that that passion is needed um, on the court because a lot of times that passion drives me. Um, I hear that crowd. I hear the chance. It, it elevates my game, elevates my play. And it's what I look forward to. And sometimes even the away team, sometimes I like the negative stuff because that drives me even more. So, but that's kind of just like how I thought about my take on it and, you know, kind of how I made decisions throughout my career. And, and fortunately it's put me in a position to where I can be financially stable and to where my wife and son is good. And, you know, I can kind of create generational wealth. Yeah, and as a small kid, I love players like you are right now. These, you know, short guys with that big passion and just destroying defense and, you know, winning titles for, for their teams. Do you remember who were your idols, uh, for example? Yeah, my favorite player was Allen Iverson. Okay. Yeah. Um, just because I love Michael Jordan, I love Kobe Bryant, but like they have physical attributes that I didn't have. Like, it's one thing to love a player. You can love LeBron James, all of them, but as a as a kid you can't dunk like that you can't jump like that you relate like, yourself to somebody which at least looks like looks you like yeah. yeah so like i tried to watch someone who was you know similar height um who was uh, slim who was skinny uh you know if he could be successful why couldn't i and that's how i thought as a kid like you know i always tried to be positive and i always try to find the good in something so You know, you got to find someone who has your similar game or your body type. I don't care if you're a little kid. I don't care if you're a young player in Europe and you're trying to get to the year elite. Find someone who plays like you or who has your frame. Watch the game. You know, see what they do because there's something they do that European teams covet, that coaches covet. And then, you know, take parts of his game. You know, continue to be yourself, be your player, but take little things that they do. And that's kind of what I did. And so, like, with Iverson, that's how I learned how to score. Because I just watched, you know, how he continued to draw fouls, how he was really good in the pull up in the mid range area, how he would get in there in the lane with the big guys and shoot the float over them. And, you know, I just worked on those things because I figured, you know, he's a smaller guy and he has to use these type of moves. You know, maybe I am. And then I really worked on my handle um, just to be able to kind of get space when I want it. And, and, and then, you know, you kind of tweak it a little bit when I came to Europe. Um, a guy I watched, um, People probably maybe don't remember, but like he was at Panathinaikos, uh, David Logan. You know, he he was skinny. Uh, he still can, he still he still scored in Italy. Yeah, yeah he's, he was one of the top scorers the last season. Crazy. Like, I don't know how old he is now, but I mean, he was a guy who could really score. And so, like, I don't just watch guys who are just really good. Like, I tried to watch guys who I felt like maybe I could do something like that, or maybe their body types are like mine because it translates better. And, you know, you watch those guys, you learn, you pick some things up and you see some things like even little things like you watch Spanulis, he always go opposite of the screen. So, like, I tried to, like, learn that for my time in Greece. That's why I really learned how to draw fouls from, from playing in Greece because they're the best at, at drawing fouls. But, you know, every place I played, you know, you made a player. I tried to take, you know, a little something from this player and, and it, it really helped me. But Allen Iverson was the base, you know, of everything that I watched to try to you know, I guess, develop that scoring instinct. What did you learn from coach uh, Ergin Nataman, who you played for, like, in Galatasaray for two times, and then in Anadolu FS, when he probably replaced Velimir Prasovic, right, during that season, 2017-18? He's the most confident coach <laughs> I've ever met. And, like, it's it's a good thing because it rubs off on all his players. Like, he's always cool, calm, collected, like, He believes he always has the best team and he believes he has the best point guard, the best shooting guard, the best small forward. And he'll tell you, I could have signed him. I didn't want him. I chose you. And so like when a coach shows that like confidence in you, you kind of want to go show him like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to show why he chose him. Like he's just, he has, he's charismatic. Um, and, and when you believe you can do anything, like you can't, like he'll, he'll, not many coaches will do it. He'll come out and tell you, we're going to win the Euro Cup. We're going to win the yearly. Like he said that when I was at Galatasaray and we won it. He said it uh, last season really, with yeah, FS. Yeah. And so like when you feel like a coach, he believes in you like that, it's just different. And he gives his players freedom. So like he's really good at picking the players. Him and his assistant, Jakob, they pick the players. Um, and it's guys who fit, you know, together, but also in the system. And then he lets you play, um, you know. And that's the thing. A lot of coaches, they sign you and, Maybe they try to control things, but he has the confidence and I'm going to sign the player 
And I'm going to trust sometimes to allow him to make decisions on the court. I'm going to trust him to make choices. And, and when you give um, good players freedom, um, their talent goes to another level. Like, I mean, you've seen it. Um, Misic was a solid player as Algiris, but when he got the FS and he got that freedom. And we never saw that coming, actually, really. It, it, that freedom is different. When you get that confidence behind you and then the freedom to make mistakes, the freedom to miss shots, um, you will see players really take off. Now, you can still be good, you know, in a structured system or, you know, with less freedom, but you have mentally, you have to be incredible because, you know, in a yearly, sometimes you start the game over two, you know, you're just subbing out, you know. So, like, when you get to play through that, you're going to see a different type of thing, like a different type of or and confidence in players and you're going to see them start to blossom especially younger players because they struggle with confidence more than anything but you want you, you know what makes me sad that he didn't keep you uh, for the next season in in <laughs> fs because you know since he knew you from galatasaray you know i was not like sure but it would be very logical for him you know to keep you of course rodrick bobua or shane larkin they're hell of the players uh, but you know do you remember anything about that summer 2018 and maybe you also had you know kind of the same uh belief that he might keep you you know for the another year you were the top scorer of that team uh, if i'm right yeah yeah you were the top scorer of the fs well you never know what's going to happen um like sometimes in organizations sometimes coaches make decisions sometimes boards sometimes presidents, sometimes gms like you never really know and um i think they just wanted to kind of uh shake it up yeah. kind of clean house and for me like i mean it's basketball like i understand every time you play you really have to go in with the mindset that it's year to year you know, especially in europe you could sign a two three year deal and my mindset is always it's year to year like you would like to be somewhere multiple years but i just know how things can change and twist i've seen guys sign two three year deals and i've seen teams try to get out of contracts i've seen teams try to make you practice three times a day like this is my 12th season i've been seeing a lot of things maybe uh, things that maybe not too ethical, maybe things that they try to force a player to maybe take less money. But if you sign a contract, you know, most players are gonna stay and fight. It just depends on the situation. But, you know, for me, like, um, I enjoyed my time with Adam and like, you know, we won championship together. Um, you know, he helped make me a winner. Um, I have no, no, no problems with him. I wish him the best. You know, sometimes we still talk you know, and I, you know, when they're making their runs and, you know, I'm wishing them well, him and Yaka, because anytime you win something with a coach, you always have a, a special relationship with them. Um, and it ended up being good for us both. You know, I ended up going to Unix. Uh, I had a two year contract there. You know, it was, I was fine. I was pleased with the terms and I enjoyed my time there. And, and they had a good season. I think that was the year maybe the season was cut short because of COVID, mm -hmm. but they had played really well. And, you know, as well, you just you you can't be sentimental. Like you got to understand this is business. You know, sometimes you're going to be with a team, sometimes not. Sometimes they go a different direction. And for me, I never really I never I never get emotional. Like I know, like I said, all you need is one team to want you. And as long as you got one team to want you every year, you'll always have a job. This this year, Lokomotiv was the team which really wanted you. What are your goals for which is actually interesting for the fourth season in a row in Russia. What do you like about Russia that much? And what, uh, what are your goals uh, with Loco? I don't know if it's I like Russia or Russia likes me, but <laughs> it's a combination of both, I think. Um, for me, like, I'm from Ohio, so like a little bit of cold weather, the snow, it doesn't really bother me. Um, I've been in a lot of places that were cold. For me, it's just about if you find a place where you're appreciated, somebody wants you, uh, where they allow you to play your game and where you can um, help a team win and those are all I want like and when I find that in a team um, you know it makes me happy and I think I found that in local a team that wanted me I wanted to be here I was blessed enough to have good weather so I actually chose a city in Russia with good weather this year and it's a team with ambitions and goals and um, Euro Cup's gonna be tough this year um, Valencia is always a challenge they keep the same core really good players um, Obviously, Bologna, they've had the same team for two or three years. They're eager to get to the year league. They have one of the best playmakers in Europe, um, Tidosic. Um, Partizan. Partizan. I mean, anytime you have Obradovic, you know, as a coach, you're always in a run for something. Um, he's just a great mind, um, strategy-wise, X's and O's, and his experience level. And they put together a strong roster. Um, so it won't be easy. Um, I've never any championship is never easy, but I think I bring experience here. Um, I've actually won the competition, so 
you know, I can kind of, you know, help the younger players, help guys who are in, in that stage of the career where they're trying to make a name for themselves in Europe, you know, and I think um, my calming influence, um, my ability to, to step up in big games, to make big shots, I think that would be, you know, a, a big help. And I think, you know, our goal is to compete, you know, against them and to try to get a championship. But I think we're so far away from that right now just because, you know, it's a new team, it's a new roster, it's a lot of young players that we had to just take it step by step. And so, like, oftentimes I try not to focus on the end picture because it, it destroys the process. Um, you can't think about um, Z in the alphabet when you got to go through A, B, C, D, E, F. So, like, it's just like the numbers. You can't think about 10. You got to start at 1, 2, and every day we got to work and improve. And, you know, I'm hoping by the time we you know get through training camp, by the time we develop chemistry, we develop roles, um, guys mature, um, everybody understands what's needed, understanding the coach's offense, what he wants from us defensively. I'm hoping that we can be a team that maybe is in the mix and that's mentioned later on. It won't be easy. It's always hard in Russia, um, the travel, tough trips, um, you know, just dealing with a lot of circumstances. But, you know, we have talent. Um, we have a team that um, is ambitious, that wants that. And that's the most important. We have an organization that wants to push for that. Um, they oftentimes do things to help put you in position. And I think with local, we'll have an opportunity and we can be as good as we want. And we just got to continue to work. And it's going to be ups and downs. We're going to lose some games. We're going to win some games. But you got to stay even killed. And you can't allow the wins or the losses or any of the outside noise, you know, to affect your focus or your vision on the pitcher. How do you feel? How, how many years do you have in, in, in your tank? Uh, for me, I never really thought about it. Um, only because, like, I still feel young. I feel good. I move well. I can shoot the ball. And, like... My game is predicated on skill, you know, being able to get to spots, pull up. I feel like no matter how old you get, you're going to always be able to shoot. You're going to always be able to play pick and roll. Um, and you'll always be able to draw fouls. You know, so for me, I just try to take care of my body. And I've been blessed to have no injuries. Um, I miss any substantial time. And I just hope it continues. But I love the game. So as long as I love the game and the game loves me, and by that I mean, like, if teams still offer you, if teams still want you, like, I'll continue to play. Um, oftentimes the game's done with you before you're done with it. But if you take care of your body, um, you continue to play at a high level and you win, I think you can stretch out the career. So, like, um, I haven't thought about a, a specific number because I don't want to limit myself. But, you know, I think retirement is far on the back burner for me just because, you know, at the level I can still play. And I think you'll see this season uh, when you watch the games that I mean, we're far away from that. But I know it's um, approaching one day and, you know, I've already thought about, you know, things post-basketball career to kind of set things into place to get ready for when that day may come. But mentally, you know, I'm locked in 100% into the game and I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. That's good to hear for all our fans who expect to see you and CJ in Barcelona. <laughs> But, you know, when the day comes, uh, I mean, uh, I see talent, I see huge dedication, uh, discipline, uh, mentoring, a lot of uh, what it takes probably to be a good head coach and uh, to be a good scout in the beginning. Do you see yourself head coaching in, I don't know, in Europe or, or, or whatever, uh, whatever else? Because I've also heard that you're kind of, you know, an encyclopedia of European basketball. So <laughs> you, should, you should, you know, use all your skills. Uh, uh, that would be fun. That would be fun. Um, I do love the game. Um, I like to watch it, analyze it and try to learn as much as I can. I think I'm a guy who's maxed out, you know, my talents and my potential and took basketball further than anybody would have expected, you know, from where I started. And um, I think um, I'm going to go into the broadcasting field. Um, you know, um, you're away from your family a little less, a little bit better job security um, in broadcasting than in coaching. And, um, you know, that way I can still kind of help players. I can still be around the game. You know, I can dissect it. Um, speak about it, talk about it. I don't know which level yet. Um, could be NBA, could be co collegiately. Uh, who knows? Maybe even some Euro elite stuff too. That would be fun. But I think um, coaching is great, but it just takes so much time, stress, um, ages you, and um, you just away a lot. Like you travel so much, and you know maybe that's something that I might do one day. But you know, as a new father, um, as a husband. I want to kind of be home a little bit more. My whole life has always been on the road. So 
I think I'm gonna take the broadcasting field. Who knows? Maybe you might. Maybe me and you might do something together. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, so, although it makes me sad, you know, hearing that you're not, you know, following for some head coaching career <laughs> because I believe you could be a good head coach. But yeah, maybe we will do some uh, projects uh, after you retire. But before that, you know, we, it was a pleasure uh, to listen to you. Uh, I wish you, you know, to to have all these uh, years on the European basketball uh, courts. It was a big pleasure to listen to you. And uh, at the same time, I think we all kind of witnessed that Eric McCollum is more than just a regular basketball player. And there's a very interesting story behind uh, behind him. So Eric, thanks for being on the Urbanus podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. It was fun. And I hope to see you again next time I'm in Lithuania. Oh, yes. And thanks all for watching us. Uh, I can uh, just remember you that you can follow us on basketnews.com, on Basket News YouTube channel and all the audio platform, uh, platforms. The Urbanus podcast. See you soon.